All right, good morning. How's everybody? Anyone enjoy the Super Bowl? I got my Mahomes. <laughs> I was going to wear my jersey. I was telling my class before this, I spoke like food all over it. So it was, it was not an unwearable condition today. But I did wear my Mahomes socks. Right. Um, right. I, was, I was excited that they won. It was a good game. You want to watch, watch the game? My kids all came out for the halftime show, right? And I was like, oh, hello, children. And then they disappeared again. And I, like, I, don't, I kept yelling, like, there's one minute left and it's tied. They're like, I don't care. <laughs> all right, fine. I'm watching it all by myself. Uh, the, what did you think of the halftime show? It was good. Uh, I love the movie. Do you like yeah. her? Yeah, it was the best. Yeah. I didn't realize she was uh, like all the, the controversy about her being pregnant. I uh, didn't realize until until yesterday. And then uh, her lip syncing though was a little bad. There were so many times she pulled the microphone away and just kept going. I'm like, oh, people. Like we all know it's recorded. But uh, anyway, I thought the Super Bowl was was fun. Now I don't know what to do with myself because football's over. I have to wait. Baseball is coming soon, but I have to wait all the way until uh, all the way till August. Right, my kids are like celebrating. There's no more football, but it's all right. <laughs> I um, I want to remind you of something. Uh, hopefully, this isn't a surprise. I've been talking about it for a little bit. Right, uh, but our first exam is on Wednesday, so on Wednesday we will not have class. Okay, so we won't be meeting in person. You're taking the exam on campus and okay? like we've talked about before uh basically the exam will open up at 12.01 a.m and it'll close at 11.59 p.m so you don't have to take it at 10 o'clock but you have from 10 to 11.15 free because it's when we would have been meeting so if your day is busy make sure you take it at this time if you would rather take it earlier or later it totally is fine just make sure you take it before 11.59 p.m because then it will close and it's too late to take it. So please just plan ahead for Wednesday. Um, I'm gonna, I'll be here. So I'll write a note on the board if you forget and show up and you're like, where is everyone? There'll be a note. Um, or I might even be here standing here to remind you. But uh, remind yourself, I'll send out an, a message Tuesday night to remind you as well. That way you don't come here early or this is the only class you have to come for, you don't come at all. Uh, but that way you can take it online. You're using your notes, you can use your book. Remember that there is a study guide on Canvas for you. So if you go to modules right here, and then right here at the top, see so it says study guide number one. Um, so anything that's on the study guide, those are the things that you need to know for the test. So make sure you know everything from chapters one, two, four, five, and six, which we'll finish up today. Um, and if it's on here, it's on the test. If it's not on here, you don't need to worry about it. Mainly multiple choice and true false, with a few short answer, um, but that will be on Wednesday. So again, we won't be meeting. Uh, I expect all of you to do really, really well because you use your notes in your book. Make sure you look at the second page on this too. If you scroll down, uh, there are two diagrams. These are the exact diagrams you will see on the exam. Okay, so make sure that you are able to label both of the, uh, everything that's on these diagrams. You're going to be picking it from like multiple choice and matching. So you don't have to spell, uh, but you will be matching them and labeling. So I gave you the exact pictures, so make sure you practice and study with those. Make sure you review everything. I would really recommend studying, uh, but if you study and prepare, you should be in wonderful shape, okay? And that will be on Wednesday. Are there any questions about the exam? Anything that you confused about or anything wrong about the, about the test? No exams are stressful, but you get to take it online, so hopefully that will make it a little less stressful. That's my hope anyway. Um, and then Monday is a holiday, right? President's Day. So um, after today, I won't see you for like a week and a half. Sad. They're going to sad things over there. It's a little sad, right? So I won't see you Wednesday because the evening. And then I won't see you Monday because of President's Day. So when I see you next, we'll be moving on. Um, our next chapter is sexual orientation, which is chapter 11. Okay? So we'll kind of do gender, then anatomy, then orientation, all very connected topics. Anything, anything about the exam at all? Anything, questions, any comments? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, so like. It's a great book. Yeah. It's really um, like conversational. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you like it. My favorite part about this book is how diverse it is, mm -hmm. right? They give you a lot of like diversity, a lot of pop culture and it's, yeah. 
I like it. And I think the book, like for a lot of people, the book, um, it's just kind of to fill in gaps, right? So I think it's good to read as, a, as an aid to fill in the gaps from lecture. Um, the exam is on here, right? So just to point out really quickly one more time, right here, if you click on quizzes, right? So here's where exam number one is. Okay, so that's where you'll take the test. You remember you only get one attempt. So just make sure that you're ready and ready to go. You have good internet quiet place or headphones or whatever, um, just make sure you're all set before you begin. Um, and if you run into problems on that day, taking it, email me. Amen. Hopefully you don't, but if you do, send me a quick email. Yeah. Yeah, so I would say 90% of the study guide is stuff that we've talked about um, in lecture and in the PowerPoints. If you don't recognize it from the lecture, it's in the book. So about 10% is stuff that we didn't cover that's in the book. Yeah, great question. Anything, anything else before we leave this? I just wanted to make sure you're feeling as uh, good about it as you can. Again, I know exams are, are stressful, but are we feeling okay? okay? Have a snack during the test. That helps, right? I like to snack during anything, everything. Ex exams too, right? If you studied with a snack, eat a snack during the exam. It'll only help. The same snack. The same snack. Yep, if you study drinking coffee, like if you study drinking like a coffee drink, drink a coffee drink during the exam. State dependent memory, it might help just a little bit. If you study listening to music, listen to music during the exam, right? If you study during certain lighting, recreate the lighting, like all those little things. They're not like miracles, but they help a little bit. Like if you study listening to like a certain group of songs, play the same ones when you're taking the test, right? All those things help a little, right? A little, any little thing can help. Study with M&Ms, eat M&Ms on the test and bring some for me, right? <laughs> All right. Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll get back to where we left off. Um, so we talked last time about like external male anatomy, right? So we went through and talked about some of the like main external uh, pieces of male anatomy and their functions uh, with our, our wonderful pictures, right? And we left off here, if I remember correctly. Uh, so what we'll talk about today are some of the internal structures. We'll talk about sperm production quite a bit. Um, that's a big uh, element of internal male anatomy. Uh, and that's where we will start. So um, when we're talking about sperm production, we're talking about the testes or the testicles. Sperm production has a, a long name to it. Spermatogenesis. Production of sperm. And this is a really involved process, right? Just to put that out there. In total, this takes 64 to 72 days to complete from beginning to end. From a sperm to be started, to being mature enough to be released during intercourse or during ejaculation, 64 to 72 days. So it's quite a process, a lot of different steps, a lot of different elements going on. Um, so what we see is that it takes about 50 days for the sperm to develop. So they develop for 50 days and then they're stored to mature for roughly 14 days. And so kind of two pieces to it. They're being developed and processed and um, being formed. And then they go to like a storage chamber to mature um, to become ready to be released. So quite a bit of things going on. So we'll talk about the different um, areas that are involved, but this is taking place in the testicles, which are within the scrotum. And we talked about that last time that they're very um, temperature sensitive region, right? It has to be in like an optimal range for everything to occur properly. Uh, and so what we see is that this starts in an area called the seminiferous tubules. The seminiferous tubules are these thin coiled structures in the testes that produce sperm. Now this comes out to something like 700 feet of tubing. If you were to unwind the tubes of the seminiferous tubules, 700 feet. Now they're wound very, very tightly. Uh, they produce, does anyone remember roughly how many sperm a day men produce? Yeah. 300 million, nice job, 300 million a day. So women um, mature one egg a month, Women or men produce 300 million sperm a day. 
right? So uh, quantity versus quality, right? We have a, a big difference here. Uh, so 300 million a day, right? But interesting, a lot of these, again, a very long process starting in those seminiferous tubules. And so when they're developing here, after they've gone through 50 days of being developed, they then go to a storage chamber called the epididymis. The epididymis is this small little structure at the back of each of the testicles, each testes, um, where the sperm sit and wait to mature. And that takes about 14 days or so for that to happen. So what we see is that they go here, um, they lack like mobility before they're mature. So they're not able to swim. They don't have all of the different fluids that they require in order to move and to swim. Uh, and so they store here in the epididymis. And then when there's enough stimulation, whether that's through intercourse or like manual stimulation or any kind of like erection, uh, the ejaculatory process begins and those mature sperm go from the epididymis to the vas deferens. The vas deferens is a sperm carrying tube, begins at the back of the testes at the epididymis and ends at the urethra where they're going to leave the body. Now they go through a lot of different areas to pick up a lot of different fluids as they make that journey toward the end of the body, right? To leave the body. Um, you also see that they go through the seminal vesicles, these little glands. And these glands are gonna give them a bunch of the seminal fluid that they're part of that's released during ejaculation. We'll talk more about the seminal fluid and what's in it and what's composed of it in a minute. Um, I wanna play a little video that kind of highlights this, this process, um, just as a quick like explanation. So let me play that for you. Oops. Oh, where'd it go? Oh, sperm's journey. <laughs> The organs of the male reproductive system include the testes, seminiferous tubules, epididymis, ducts, urethra, and penis. The seminal vesicle and prostate and bulbal urethral glands produce nourishing fluid for the sperm. The testes subdivide into lobules that contain seminiferous tubules that produce sperm. Sperm moves from the seminiferous tubules to the efferent tubules to the epididymis where they mature. The end of the epididymis forms the ductus deferens or vas deferens. This structure ascends the posterior border of the testes, penetrates the inguinal canal, enters the pelvic cavity, and loops over and around the urinary bladder. The seminal vesicles are glands at the base of the bladder that produce seminal fluid. Together with the ductus deferens, they form the ejaculatory ducts. During ejaculation, these ducts eject sperm into the male urethra common passageway for urine and sperm. The prostate gland surrounds the prostatic urethra just below the bladder. The fluid it secretes goes through small ducts into the prostatic urethra. The bulbal urethral glands produce alkaline mucus secretions that empty into the urethra. The urethra passes through the penis carrying semen, a mixture of sperm and secretions of the glands. During ejaculation, the smooth muscle sphincter at the base of the bladder closes off to ensure that no urine is expelled and that semen does not enter the urinary bladder. Sperm moves from the seminiferous tubules to the epididymis, to the ductus deferens, to the ejaculatory duct, to the outside of the body by the urethra. All right. So just a quick um, overview of that process. Yeah. Close that. Go there again. Right. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's wild. The, the design of our bodies, right? Sometimes it's really fascinating and so intelligent, right? The same is true, um, and I may or may not mention it when we talk about pregnancy. For the first three months of pregnancy, uh, that baby is on a completely separate feeding system, right? Because oftentimes women don't know that they're pregnant for a time. And so anything they put in their body would, in theory, harm that baby. And so even then, our body is designed for three months. Anything that you do won't hurt that baby uh, because there's a good chance that you don't know. Right, that doesn't, yeah, that doesn't mean like go hog wild, but a lot of people won't know that they're pregnant. So maybe they're still drinking alcohol or using substances or taking a medication. You're safe from that for about like 11, 12 weeks. Um, and then um, once that fetus gets big enough, 
it feeds off of the woman's body and those things go straight to it. So yeah, our bodies are designed really intelligently at times. Right? Other times, maybe not, not so much. Yeah. Yeah, right. So after 11 or 12 weeks or so after that first trimester, anything that a woman puts in their body goes straight to the baby. Um, but that's not the case. They have their own sac that they're like um, fueled off of for the first like trimester or so. A little bit less than the first trimester. Very intelligent design. Uh, so you can again see this process, but there's a few more pieces to it, right? So they go through the vas deferens, through the seminal vesicles, and they're going to pick up a bunch of different fluid. Now, semen, right, or sperm, right, exist within seminal fluid, right? So sperm aren't released on their own. If they were, they wouldn't be able to swim. They wouldn't have any nutrition or energy or mobility. So they have to pick up a bunch of different fluids in order to give them that ability to swim. So they go through the seminal vesicles, the prostate gland, and the Cowper's gland as part of a way to pick up everything that they need in order to ultimately, I mean, the goal of ejaculating sperm is to have them reach an egg and fertilize an egg, right? That's how the body is designed for both women and for men. And so in the seminal vesicle, they get about 70% of that seminal fluid, right? Which helps to transport sperm in preparation to be ejaculated or released from a man's body. The prostate gland gives them the other 30%. And this is what makes it have that like milky white appearance of seminal fluid, right? Sperm by themselves are not that way, but the seminal fluid is like a white, milky white substance. And what this prostate seminal fluid um, adds to it is it helps to neutralize the acidity of the, of the vaginal tract or the vagina to prolong the life of sperm. The vagina or the vaginal tract is a hostile place for sperm. And they all die. Almost all of them die off. Very few of the millions and millions of sperm that are ejaculated, if they are, are inserted up into a woman's body, only one makes it all the way to the egg. Maybe two if you're lucky, right? And so of the millions only one is the lucky winner most of the time, right? A lot of them, millions of them die the minute that they're like ejaculated into the female body because the vaginal tract has a high amount of like acidity and it kills them off, right? And so what happens is this milky white fluid gives them not only energy, but it protects them from that environment so they can make the long swim up into the uterus, up into the fallopian tubes to hopefully find an egg. So what you're saying, we're the winners, right? So the sperm, uh, the egg picks the sperm, yeah. interestingly. So um, we've, we've learned that over time that the egg picks the sperm. Uh, yeah, I don't know, right? Or that one sperm is the winner. I don't know. You can view it in any way that you want, right? We're the only ones, we're the only ones who can get, you know, uh, out with, uh, Right sure. <laughs> if your goal was to get pregnant, then you can view yeah. it as a win, right? <laughs> if your goal is to not get pregnant, I don't know if you view it as a win, right? Uh, yeah. But yeah. Who uh, is the result of is the result of a an accident an accident no, i mean and it happens or unplanned we could say unplanned sounds way better than, than an accident unplanned a surprise oh all right i will never have to worry about a surprise baby <laughs> but, but uh yeah so i mean and sometimes it is a surprise it's unplanned or an accident whatever you want to call it and other times it's very well planned infertility is actually quite high in our culture. And we'll talk about that more when we get to the pregnancy unit. Uh, but without these fluids, sperm could, would have no chance of reaching an egg. So these are really important. These fluids produce that like seminal fluid. Semen or sperm by itself is not enough. You need that fluid in order to get there. Um, the Cowper's gland also plays a role. It produces a pre-ejaculate that flushes the urethra out to clean it, to make way for the sperm and seminal fluid to come through. Now, this pre-ejaculate can contain sperm, right? And so sometimes people have that like, oh, well, um, that pull-out method of like, I'll have the man like pull out before he ejaculates. That's not enough. We, you all knew that very well when we did that test. Um, I told you my brother learned that the hard way too. Uh, um, I shouldn't share that story. He was so mortified. My brother's like so proper. He's like Mormon and super conservative. He would like, he would like roll over. But, I'm going to text him and tell him I should. <laughs> just to make him uncomfortable. We're actually just going to 
Um, but that pre-ejaculate does contain some sperm. Um, and so it can be enough to get somebody pregnant, though it's not common. It can also transmit STDs or STIs um, as well. <laughs> so a little bit more about seminal fluid. And I have learned lots of random pieces of information about seminal fluid over time from questions people have asked me. A typical male ejaculate, right? So when a man ejaculates, it's typically about the size of a teaspoon, right? A volume wise of about a teaspoon. That teaspoon contains 200 to 500 million sperm. So a lot of sperm. And again, of that 200 to 500 million sperm, um, only about 200 or so will survive all the way through the fallopian tubes to the egg. And then typically one will succeed in fertilizing it. So those aren't the best odds for those sperm. 500, 500 million to one, right? Um, that you're gonna be the lucky sperm. Seminal fluid contains trace amounts of protein, carbs, sugars, and acids, right? It's very much affected by a man's diet. So what a man puts into his body can very directly impact his seminal fluid. If a man is eating a lot of like bitter, unhealthy foods, his seminal fluid would be very bitter um, and have a very like alkaline taste to it. Right? If you're performing like oral sex, for example, um, if someone is eating a lot of like sweet foods or fruits, it might be much sweeter, right? So there are definitely correlates for women as well. The things that you consume and the things that you're putting in your body can affect the taste of your ejaculate, right? Um, and so you see that very much more so for men than women, um, but definitely for both takes about 12 to 24 hours um, to affect the like taste and consistency of that seminal fluid, but it does happen. Uh, somebody asked me last year, and so I wrote, I wrote it down. Um, on average, seminal fluid is about five to seven calories. Somebody asked me how many calories are in a typical male ejaculate. Five to seven, very low carbs. <laughs> uh, somebody asked me, uh, they said their boyfriend told them that seminal fluid has teeth whitening properties. Stop. That is not true. Okay, so if a male tells you that sperm will whiten your teeth, that is a lie. That will not work. Um, there are no teeth whitening properties to seminal fluid. It's a good try, but no. Now, on the other side of that, you can, a woman or a man, like a person could in theory be allergic to somebody's seminal fluid, right? That is a thing. It's rare, but it can happen where somebody could break out into a rash and hives uh, from like having contact, oral contact with somebody's seminal fluid. Traditionally, it's thought that maybe it's related to something that man put into his body if someone had a severe allergy, but we don't really fully understand the correlation there, but it can happen. So you might not be able to use the line that's uh, teeth whitening works, but you could in theory use the line that I'm allergic. In theory, in theory, in theory. yeah. High school, I heard like this like rumor once of this one girl that ate cashews and then she like gave this guy like a blowjob. Uh -huh. He was like allergic to cashews, I guess. Uh -huh. And like get allergic reaction. Like, would that actually be a thing, or like do you not think so? I mean, it would have to be that she was literally had eaten cashews and the residue was in her mouth when she went down on him. Right? Yeah. Like it would have to be like immediate. It wouldn't be that like I ate cashews yesterday yeah. and now it's going to affect you. But I mean, literally, she'd probably have to have like pieces of cashew and saliva and yeah. cashews in her mouth as she's doing that. And then in theory, that's possible. In theory, if if they were like literally doing the two at the same time, I could. Okay. Could, could you finish that snack first just in case, right? No. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely possible, but it would have to be like immediate. Yeah. Right? Have some water. Wash out your mouth. Uh, so uh, again, I've learned some random things um, related to seminal fluid, but the, the point is that it's roughly like 500 million sperm. And again, only about one makes it 200, make it or so to the egg. And what a man puts in his body does definitely affect the taste, consistency, and viability of that sperm, right? Sometimes sperm don't mature all the way, and then they don't have the ability to swim far enough to make the journey. Um, that can happen, right? Men can have a decreased sperm count, um, that's another reason that sometimes people struggle to get pregnant. So rather than producing like 200 to 500 million sperm in an ejaculate or 300 million a day, they're only producing like a couple of million. That can happen as well. Yeah. No, it's like never mind. They produce too many. It's a lie. <laughs> no, yeah, they won't run out. Uh, and another thing that sometimes people will ask too, so if a man has a vasectomy, right, a vasectomy where they have... Um, 
they have their uh, seminal vesicles like that are severed, what happens is they still produce the seminal fluid, right? So they still have that milky white fluid. It's just no sperm in it, right? The sperm aren't entering into that fluid. And so um, they will still ejaculate and still have that like milky white like fluid, but there's no sperm. And which is why they can no longer like in theory, get somebody pregnant. Yeah. Can they like lose all of them? Lose all of the sperm? Eggs. Oh, a woman run out of eggs? Yeah. yeah, so women can have decreased egg um, production as well. So uh, it, it's possible? definitely possible. It doesn't happen very often. So are they dating with all of them? What was that? Yeah. that? Age is the most likely. What can also happen is women can have like a, a poor egg quality or poor egg production number. Um, and what you then see is sometimes that can affect their likelihood of getting pregnant. Uh, so when people do things like IVF, we'll talk about um, fertility methods. I'll tell you the whole story of how we went through all of that. Uh, but my partner had really low egg um, quality and egg count. Uh, and when you do IVF, you produce more eggs. And so you can actually deplete them faster um, by doing that. And it can cause menopause to occur early um, mm -hmm. as well for women. Not always, but it's all. Well, I was going to say, like, what for, like, like prostitutes, right? Did they have a harder time getting pregnant because they've had sex so many times? It doesn't necessarily correlate to your likelihood of getting pregnant. Um, it might make it harder to like reach orgasm or to have like as much sensitivity. You can definitely desensitize yourself a little bit to like the, the pleasurable aspect of sex um, by having it too often or like over masturbating, things like that. Uh, but it wouldn't necessarily decrease their likelihood of getting pregnant unless they maybe were on like a birth control pill to try and prevent that. That might play a role. Yeah. Um, I saw like TikToks about like this girl who had a new how to do sex with me, mm -hmm. and then she got pregnant. Yeah. How did that look? Liar. He might have. Why did he lie? Right? 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 He could have lied. He could have mm -hmm. uh, so what they're doing is they're severing the ability of that sperm to go through the tubules out. Right, So it literally can't meet up. Now, that doesn't mean you're still producing sperm, and they're just going to recycle back into the body because they're not released. So they're still there. So it's in theory possible. Let's say they didn't perform the procedure 100% correctly. There might still be enough of a pathway for them to get through it. So that might have been, it might have been a improper procedure or it could have just been that one week case. Usually permanent methods like hysterectomies and vasectomies are pretty uh they're pretty guaranteed, but not worse. Wait, but didn't you get like vasectomy reverse? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not the easiest thing to do, but you can, right? Um, you definitely can. Your odds of it being perfectly done are low, right? So it's usually it's something that you tend to consider like a permanent well, procedure. It doesn't have to be, but it's best viewed that way because it isn't always guaranteed in the years. Yeah. Um, does having a vasectomy at all like affect the you know the process or anything? No. No. So yeah. So literally, all it does is prevent the sperm from entering into the seminal fluid. Everything else functions normally. Men are still producing sperm the same amount, the same way. Um, they just cannot enter into the seminal fluid that that um, that route has been cut off from. Okay. Um, and then what happens, as I said, is they're kind of broken down by the black. And so, seeking like you were asking about, can you reverse it? What happens sometimes is men and women um, develop scar tissue around the procedures that are done, and then it can make it hard to reverse. But in theory, it can be done. But it, like I said, it's not always guaranteed. Yeah. It's a little like off topic when I remember watching the office. And then you just see where Michael was like, I got the second name for you, but then I got reverse. I got back, I got reverse. Snip, snap, snip, snap. Yep, yep, <laughs> right? Yeah, and that's not the best way to do it, right? Uh, much better to maybe wear a condom or like use other birth control methods that aren't so permanent. It's it's not a horrible procedure, but it's a, it's a medical procedure. It's a small like surgery. Um, and so best... Um, Best not done lightly, I would say. But yeah, some people do, you know. Yeah, and then when things are relatively permanent, you know, you want to give it some some thought. Right? Hold on one second. I can't remember. Okay. 
it's not the next slide. I have an activity for you, but I didn't want to accidentally give it away. Uh, so one more, um, one more step involved in this whole process here, right? So we've produced the sperm, they've matured, they've gathered all the fluids that they need in order to swim and to have the energy and mobility and to neutralize uh, the vaginal tract where they have all this stuff that they've gone through. Now they have to leave the body. Right. So in order for the sperm to leave the body, they go through this process of erection and ejaculation. Now it's a two stage process. So erection is when the penis engorges with blood, becomes erect, right, or hard, another word for that. Um, it's very much like a nervous system response. And sometimes this can be a little bit involuntary for men, especially when they're younger. Right. Very common for young men to have erections that they don't necessarily want, right? Like it can happen and it can be an embarrassing like rite of passage. Men can wake up with an erection, right? That happened like during a dream or during sleep, right? So it's something that is a very autonomic nervous system. It's a very nervous system related response, but it's also directly correlated to arousal, right? So maybe they have an arousing dream and that's why they get an erection, right? When they're in their sleep or like something, they have a thought and they get an erection, they learn to control them. But oftentimes it takes some time um, for a young man to do it. There's a lot of expansion of all the arteries. Remember all the spongy and cavernous bodies that are in the penis, they fill with blood and that's what causes the penis to become erect. Um, and then from there, uh, we go through the process of ejaculation. So erection happens first, um, and then when there's sufficient stimulation, all of those, uh, that seminal fluid builds up in, in emission phase. It builds up into the bulbs and then it's exp expelled or like pushed out of the body by those muscles, right? So there's a couple of different things going on. A man becomes aroused enough to have an erection occur. And then and, um, when there's sufficient stimulation and arousal, they have an ejaculation where all of that is released through emission and then expulsion, right? So so that would kind of complete the sperm's journey. And then in theory, if someone was trying to get pregnant, the sperm would swim up through the vaginal tract, through the uterus, into the fallopian tubes and fertilize an egg, right? That's the goal, if you will. Um, though obviously a lot of people do have erections and ejaculate with that not being the goal. Yeah. So emission is like the buildup. It all starts to build up together and like form enough pressure to be pushed out of the body. And then expulsion would be the, the release from the body. So kind of all of that um, is happening before the uh, ejaculation emission um, phase. Okay, sorry, can I repeat that next thing? Yeah, so all of the stuff that we talked about where it's all like going through all the different glands and everything happens before um, erection, right? All of that would be kind of happening already. And then a man becomes aroused and then everything is going to build up, right? And it starts to build up together to create enough pressure to actually be expelled or, or like released from the body. So I have a little, um, a little like just quick review to help you remember um, this. It's just a little like sperm order activity that I'm going to give to you. Uh, they're like the happiest looking little sperm ever, right? They're so cute. Like, I, um, I think they're cute. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you get into groups of like, let's just say like two to three people, like smaller groups, I think is easier. And I'm going to give you a sheet that says the life of a sperm cell. Now these are out of order. Okay, So I'm giving you A through H. They are out of order. Your job is to put them in order. Now just write the letter. You don't have to write the sentences because I'll feel bad when it's, if it's not right. You don't have to wait that you write it. Um, so what you'll do is you'll read through this as a group. And you're going to decide down here in the, in the space, what is the right order of events? And what I will do is I have some candy, the first couple of groups to get it right, I'll bring you some candy. But this is just for fun, it will only take us a few minutes and then we'll go through the right order. I'm going to make sure we all have it. But find a couple of people, right? So find like two or three people. I'll give you just a second to do that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I don't 
It's fine if I use this chair, right? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Sorry, I like that. No, no, you're fine. Mm -hmm. You got it. <laughs> I'm going to get to the Lord. 
Yeah. All right, so uh, let's go over the range. Uh, this is the correct answer. All right. So here's the correct order. Uh, you could go ahead and uh, you could go ahead and let it go at this point. Uh, so here's the correct order: C B F E G H A D. A lot of you uh, had the C B, and then you got off a little bit after that. So um, if we read this, right? Are we ready? Um, I'm produced. Just so I don't have to yell it. Um, I am produced in the seminiferous tubules in, of the testicles. I mature in the epididymis. When there is adequate stimulation and the penis becomes erect, I leave the epididymis and travel up into the body through the vas deferens toward the bladder and ejaculatory ducts. As I pass through the seminal vesicles, prostate gland, and the Cowper's glands, fluids are added so I can live longer and swim more easily. I am now officially the substance we call semen. The urethra carries me along with about 200 to 500 million other sperm out of the penis in a process called ejaculation. I go through the cervix and the uterus and into the fallopian tubes in search of an egg cell. If I find the ovum before the other sperm do, I will be the winner, part of a fertilized egg. All right. So again, just for fun, you're not turning that in. Um, yeah, if you want to take a picture of it, you're welcome to. But if you've got a check mark, come see me after for some for some candy. So this is definitely something I will ask you about on the exam, all right? So make sure you understand the order. If you wanna keep that page, you're welcome to. I have extras if you'd like a, an extra copy as you go today. Uh, but any other thoughts, questions, comments, anything else about sperm before we before we move before we move on? Move away from sperm. I love the way they say it in the little sperm, right? I don't know why they say that. Yeah. Animation, sperm. Say goodbye to the cute sperm. Again, the cutest little guys. So cute. All right. Couple more topics. If you want to go back to your spots, it's perfect. Okay. So a couple more topics um, related to male anatomy before we wrap it up here. Uh, we talked about this a little bit before. Expectations around penis size. So for women, a lot of expectations around like breast size and breast shape. For men, penis size, right? And this is a very big thing for men, right? It's a very uh, big expectation. A lot of men will view their penis size as a correlation to their self-worth, the worth as a lover, right? Um, there's a lot of jokes about this as well, right? And um, I have a little quote to play that in a moment for you. But men often come to view size as an important attribute in defining their masculinity or their worth as lovers. Now, remember, as I told you, the vaginal canal is four inches naturally. Right, so that's what the body of, a, of an average woman is designed to accommodate. Now it can stretch and and obviously thin out um, to accommodate for a much larger penis or object. But on average, men tend to be between like five to six inches when erect. That is the average in our country. But we do have a lot of expectations around it, and that can be a big, um, you know, a self esteem piece for a lot of men. Uh, Again, lots of jokes about this. Um, this is super old, but I saw it like a few weeks ago and it reminded me, so I'm gonna play it for you. Um, there's a little like Jeff Foxworthy joke about like uh, penis size. And so I have the, I saved the little clip from his comedy to play for you. <laughs> 